Erev Tov, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, my dear Fandori, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for the speakers and the, for you who are still here. And so I will talk about how do we invest in uh, uh, medtech companies and how do we actually uh, try to make a profit out of that. Now, um, to go two steps back, in order to have a successful medical or also software startup, there, there are some basics. We, without them, we don't know how to start a business, we don't know how to sell, make a profit, on, and we don't know how to sell the business at the end. So one, we need a good business case. It, has, it needs a big potential. If you go to a Metronic and you try to sell them a technology, if it's something which is not addressing a market of at least a few hundreds of millions of dollars, it's a no-starter. You need a very clear need. It has to be well-defined by the industry, by the doctors, by the users, by the HMOs, by everybody around it. It has to be very well-defined and it has to make sense. It has to make uh, medical sense, it has to make technological sense and it has to make financial sense. If you look on most of the big breakthroughs which we had in medical technology, especially in Israeli medical technology, then the technology made a real change. If, you, if we look on uh, the various, uh, just a few weeks ago, we looked on Covidian, there was a very clear reasoning to why they bought, to why they bought given imaging, for an example. It made sense. There was a very clear financial structure of why Metronic bought Vento a few years ago. And we can go through every exit and exit, or we, go, we can go to every successful startup that does well. It makes also, it has to make also financial sense. And we'll get back to that soon. An important ingredient is strong IP. We are far away from the markets. What we actually bring to the United States, to Europe, or now to India and China, is strong IP, something which the others don't have, something which in this place, here in Haifa, you're very well aware of how to do it and how to create it. This is what gives us value. Now, as an investor, at the end of the day, you either have, either have again, a profitable company that has nice sales, nice dividends, or Unfortunately, you have to exit. So, what I will talk today is a, there's a lot of technology. There, there's definitely a need if we look on the systems, if we look on the HMOs, if we look at the Kupat Cholims, as we spoke before, if we look at the hospitals, there's a clear need to save. But in order really to save, someone has to pay for this technology. If someone will not pay for these technologies, then the chances that those technologies will actually hit the market are low. The chances that you will be able to finance a startup in round B, C and D will be low. Unfortunately, HMOs and insurance companies buy a fraction, a fraction, of technologies than the J&Js, the Metronics, and the Boston Scientific spy. They are the ones who will make the profit, but they don't buy the technology. They don't bring those technologies to the markets. We saw here at Kupat Cholim, uh, Kupat Cholim Klalit, beautiful. Um, in Israel, we are true leaders in that field, but if we look at it technology-wise, the integration is a lot of work. Educating the system, the doctors and everybody is a lot of work, but technology-wise, there's not much new. Now, no disrespect. In order to take solid technologies which are today and make a huge group like the Kupat Cholin Kredit actually using it, that's a huge undertaking. But there are no medical startups that can actually build new technology and bring it out there. And I want to talk on two sides of 
the acquisitors, those, those who could actually buy the companies and bring the products to the market, and how they are versus technologies like we saw today. And I will start with the medical potential, uh, potential buyer. The Medtronics, the J&Js, those are the ones that make the big acquisitions. Just the Covidians, again, it's a billion dollar acquisition here in Israel just a few weeks ago. They know what they can actually sell today, in five, in seven, and in ten years. They know from what they can make a profit. They know if there's a procedure, how to, make, how to fix at the beginning an aortic valve, an open heart surgery, they knew. Edwards had the understanding why it makes sense to buy a technology to do it percutaneously. Although the procedure itself is more expensive, but at the end of the day, they'll be able to sell it because it, someone will pay for it because it will save someone money. We had it with aortic valve, now we have it with mitral valve. The case is more complicated. But someone will pay $30,000 for a valve because it will save money. Who will pay those $500 or $700 million that those startups will cost? Because to make such a trial is something between 30 and $75 million. We have two companies in that field. It will not be a HMO. It will be probably be a Metronic, an Abbott, a Boston Scientific. They also have the marketing channels. They know how to talk with the doctors. They understand the regulatory. They know what the reimbursement is all about. They know how to take a procedure which has a reimbursement of so-and-so, and today the devices are just so much, and the rest is costs in the hospitals and around it, and they know how to sell a more expensive device, but then the costs will be less, so the hospital will make a profit so they can sell it. They understand that. They have, of course, experience in lobbying, how to get FDA approval, how to get proper reimbursement, we, we just had a few years ago, we had this beautiful example with the first coated stent of J&J. I don't know uh, uh, how few, uh, many of you remember it. On the day that it got FDA approval, it already had reimbursement. Now, this a j and can make it. Not many groups in the world can achieve such a thing. Now, in order to buy a software-related technology, they need to develop the relevant marketing channels for that. Now, their clients are not used to talk with them about that. The whole marketing, the business development divisions, they're not used to make a case for such a technology. Big data, and we can go on and on, this is not something which they're used and know how to sell. How do they get reimbursed for that? They don't know how to do it. Now, if you look on the software players, it's even more difficult. It's not enough that you're very talented and just started to Google or Microsoft and you know very much in your field. It, do it doesn't say that you will be able to take a medical-related technology and bring it out to the market. Yes, you know what you're doing in software. You have a lot of money. You can buy just startups today. We saw this cheetah thing, robot. They, Google paid for that almost a billion dollars. They can buy it. But you don't know how the medical world really works. Now, even if you will buy 200 of the best doctors, 200 of the best engineers and put them in one place, your whole company didn't grow on that. You don't live it. We just saw now there's a, a company of a few hundreds of millions of dollars invested in it and just they had to close it down because they didn't understand the dynamics of what can you do in the medical world as a software player. They just didn't know and, it, and they had to close down. Cost benefit, it's a complete actually saying is, is that it will take time until the Googles and the Microsofts 
will be able to become real player in that field. It probably will happen someday, like the Metronics and the J&Js will. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know who out of them it will really be. Who would be the strong players there? I don't know. But if I would be an entrepreneur today in 2013, 14, and I would start my startup, I cannot count on that, that they will learn that within the next five, six, seven years. It will not happen, for sure. It, the, their learning curve to go into a new area is decades. So, how will those two, the medical world and the software world, how, how will they converge? We don't know. Maybe it will start from the, what we call the combined players, those who make the medical devices and make the softwares also, like the Siemens's, the HP's, the GE's, the Toshiba's. Maybe it will come from them. We see a lot of work being conducted by Siemens, for an example. But still, they're not a big player. They're still not a big acquire of technologies. But it may come from their side. From the investor side, like we are, we have... Most of what we do is medical advice, but we also have software. So the combination there allows us to look from both angles into those technologies. And we look a lot, but I have to tell you, it's a challenge to make a good business case and therefore to invest in such companies. The yeah. other way, which as an entrepreneur I would definitely go and look at, is to start a business which can be bootstrapped. Not every business has to be sold to a Microsoft. Not every business has to be sold to a Metronic. If there is a model, and it's a big challenge, that you can actually become slightly profitable, slowly, you will not have to go and raise the amounts of money which medical startups or software startups actually raise. Then this may be a good possibility, but this is a different sort of a company. This is, these are not companies that go for a new technology and burn a lot of money. So what's the right model? How actually to do it? And we saw today extremely interesting companies is still a big challenge. Now here in this place in the Technion, there is a lot of knowledge. What we saw from our experience at home is that you need, in order to really to understand how to take such a company to the market, you need to understand the life science world, you need to understand the software world, but you also have to have the third leg. And this is how to build a business out of it. How to structure a business. So it's not a technological challenge as much as it is a structural business development and marketing challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you.